is from the Champagne region of France. And you can only call it a Champagne if it's from the Champagne region of France. And, and the classic Champagne is a, is a blend of a Chardonnay, um, a Pinot Noir, and, 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 and Pinot Minuaire. So that's kind of the classic Champagne. Now, if it's the same wine, like made somewhere else, you know, this one made by, you know, Hagafen in Napa, um, you can't call it a champagne. You have to call it a sparkling wine, but it's the same grapes, but, you know, because it's not from champagne, it's a sparkling wine. Um, and Hagafen is a very nice vineyard. Um, so if you're interested in, you know, visiting vineyards and visiting wineries, you know, this is the kosher one in, in Napa to visit. And, and it's a, and it's a kind of great place where you can go to the winery and if you like to drink wine, you can do that. If you like to see the vineyards, which I'm actually more interested in the vineyards than the tasting room, uh, you know, you can go out there too. Um, and then, you know, I, and then, then I put some like sweet wines, you know, on my list too. And, and basically um, sweet wines are, you know, of different categories. So like the M. Du Castel, like, you know, that I put on the list is a Castel wine, which is a Moscato that's a late harvest. So basically when you harvest them later, the sugar content goes up. Um, and when the sugar content goes very high, when the wine is fermented, it can't completely ferment. So it leaves some sugar behind. So when you see a late harvest wine, they're kind of a sweeter wine. So Castel makes that one. Uh, Hagafen makes a, a nice like late harvest Chenin Blanc. Um, now in France, uh, there are wines uh, from the Sauterne region. Um, and those are kind of very interesting because um, they're infected with this fungus called Botrytis, you know, you know, to, while at the end, you know, when they're about to be picked. And it's, it's also called noble rot. It's, uh, it's not a bad fungus. Like there are a lot of funguses that will destroy the whole crop, but this one basically kind of dehydrates the grape, kind of makes it almost like a raisin and kind of concentrates the sugar. So you can make wine, when you make wines out of that, it's a sweeter wine because it's kind of a higher concentration of sugar. And in, in Italy, in the, in the Cinque Terre area, you know, there's also, they have a, you know, several hundred year old tradition of making wines from grapes that have been left out in the sun to kind of dehydrate and make a sweeter wine. Um, and then if you've heard of ice wine, you know, basically that's a wine, you know, uh, it's grown in colder climates like Canada and, you know, Austria, uh, which is basically grapes that have been allowed to like stay on the vines for a long time until like the frost starts coming. Um, so it's a very extremely late harvest wine, which is also kind of a sweeter wine. Um, so that's about wines. Now we're going to get to the tasting. So if you have a bottle of wine, Yardin or, or anything, we're going to, first we're going to kind of pour some in there. So if you, if you have some, you can kind of, kind of do that. And, uh, you know, you don't need a lot, you know, an ounce or two. Um, so there's a, couple things we're going to do. So the first thing, you know, I'll, I'll make you like look like an expert. So, you know, next time you're at the Shabbat table or the Seder or a restaurant, you know, you'll really impress like your family and friends. So, so first you want to look at the color and the best way to look at the color is to, you know, put it down like uh, against a white background, you know, not to like put up in the light because that doesn't kind of distorts it. So you, so, so you look at the color. Um, now, um, Cabernet, you know, Sauvignon classically is a, it's a darker wine. Um, you know, the, the, the grape skins are kind of thick and, and dark and it, it kind of, you know, makes a, a dark wine. So, so you'd call this like a violet color. Like for example, a, a Pinot Noir um, is a lighter color, like, like a ruby color. But, you know, this you'd say is kind of like violet. Um, and, and you could also look at things um, like an aged wine um, has like, you see like a brownish tint to it, you know, particularly kind of edges that you're, uh, as you're looking at it. So if you see a, a wine that sort of has an amber kind of, you know, aura to it, you know, that's sort of a, could be an older wine that's been aged longer. Um, you know, and obviously kind of, you know, white wines are more in the um, kind of, you know, golden hue, uh, you know, kind of spectrum. So that's, that's the first thing you do, you look at the color. You know, the next thing we're gonna do, you know, we're gonna swirl it. You know, this is like, you really look pretentious when you do this. 
So you're going to kind of <laughs> swirl it. And, and these tulip in a glass like this, it, it's you know, besides like, you know, looking cool, it, it also, it, it lets the aromas sort of kind of circulate in there, you know, this, so you, you kind of you swirl it and you're kind of releasing aromas. Now, now if, if you look at it, you know, closely, you, you may see like these, uh, when, you, when you're doing that, sort of alcohol is kind of evaporating in there and you may see, um, you know, kind of like rivulets of, of wine kind of, um, you know, kind of coming down the side, um, which is basically, you know, after it's evaporated, it kind of leaves that behind. So if, if you see that, you can kind of hold that up to the light and you see, you know, sort of almost like drippings of the wine. And, and that's called legs. So if you kind of, you know, if you're with a group of people and you kind of swirl and you say, nice legs, you know, they'll really be impressed. So, so those are kind of like the, the legs of the wine. Um, you can also kind of like judge viscosity, like a sweet wine would be more viscous wine. You know, this is, you know, a dry wine, so it's not as viscous. Um, so, so that's the first thing. So I'm going to turn you into like a wine, you know, tasting pro. So, you know, you'll, you'll really be uh, impressive. Now, now, the next thing is, is, is the smell. This is kind of one of my favorite parts. Because I don't, because full disclosure, I, I don't really drink. You know, I'll take a sip, um, but you'll never see me like drink a shot of anything. Um, but I like to make wine and like to make good wine and I'll take a sip to make sure it like, you know, tastes good. Um, but uh, I like to smell them. So, so you kind of swirl it, you know, swirl good. And then you stick your nose right in it and take a, you know, don't be shy. Stick your nose right in it and take a good whiff. And, uh, and, um, and uh, what do you smell? Um, now, now, some people uh, will say smells like wine, you know, or tastes like wine, and, and that's okay. But like some people have like really trained noses and palates and can discern all these like smells and flavors. So, you know, if you had one of those, you would say, you know, this smells um, like blackberries or, or plums. Um, and, and basically a Cabernet is kind of characterized by like a black fruit profile. So like, um, again, like kind of the blackberries, you know, the plums, currants. So, you know, it, it, again, even if you don't know what you're talking about, you know, if you're with somebody and you're kind of tasting a, a Cabernet and you're smelling, you say, I smell like blackberry and plums and currants. And, and you know, and if you really want to be like, you know, really consider cool, you say like, oh, I smell like a hint of ginger, because like some people smell that in this wine and maybe you can smell it. I don't know, maybe. <laughs> All right, so maybe some ginger in there. Um, but like a Pinot Noir, for example, is more like a red fruit character. So a Pinot Noir is more like, you know, the, the strawberry, the raspberry, the cherry, um, you know, has a profile of that uh, in terms of kind of the, what, what you smell and, and what you taste. And, uh, and uh, a Merlot, you know, could be, have both of those, um, you know, and especially, you know, could depend when it's harvested as well. So, so, so that's kind of the, the, the smell. Um, now, the next thing is the, is the taste. Now, when, when you taste a wine, you kind of take a sip, you know, it doesn't have to be a big sip, but you kind of splash it all over your mouth. So you get it on your tongue, you get it on your palate, you know, you get it all over your mouth. So, cause their taste buds like all over and, and the taste buds kind of taste different things. So you, you know, so you want to get it kind of all over and, and, and just uh, we'll kind of go over this again, but you know, things you want to pay attention to, you know, one like flavors, you know, that you can taste, um, you know, two is, uh, you know, the acidity of the wine and, and kind of on the side of your mouth, you can detect like a tartness to it. So you can, you know, some wines are more, you know, you know, acid than others. Um, you know, another thing you want to pay attention to is something called tannins, which are, um, they're, they're from red grape skins. Um, and it, it basically, um, you kind of feel like a velvety kind of coating, you know, to your, to your mouth. Um, in your palate and your tongue. Um, so wines are described as having like high tannins or low tannins. Um, you know, and the other thing is, is alcohol content. And, and uh, when, you, when you taste the wine, you feel the alcohol kind of in your throat. So 
you know, people describe like the heat of the wine. It's a really hot wine. And so, you know, a high alcohol content. And this wine, for example, it's 14.5% alcohol, which is kind of relatively high. I mean, it's, it's sort of, you know, Cabernets are usually in the, you know, 14, you know, close to 15% range. Um, you know, Chardonnays <clears throat> maybe closer to the, you know, 13 or 14%. Um, but again, it, it's, it's sort of based also on how, because all the sugar gets converted to alcohol, you know, the, the alcohol content is a reflection of, of what the sugar started at. Um, so, uh, so the, the, those, and, and other things, if, if you, um, um, well, let's taste it. So you can like take a sip. and swallow and then like take a deep breath in your mouth and out your nose because that like you know releases uh you know because the smell and the taste are sort of kind of connected and, and that sort of uh you know um your like olfactory you know you know bulb and and, and your smell senses kind of you know interact with the taste and uh and and you can kind of get expressions of different tastes. So um, can anybody taste anything other than like good wine? <laughs> so again, if you were like a pro, uh, you would say, oh, it's like blackberry and plum. Or if you're like really cool, you'd say, oh, it's like blackberry jam, or maybe you'll say like fig. Um, but blackberry and plum is like the classic way to kind of describe this wine. And, and again, if you, you know, tasting wine is like, you know, developing, uh, you know, you know, kind of other senses, like, you know, exercising your, you know, your, your, your pal and your taste. So, yeah, you, you know, so these sommeliers, you know, who, um, you know, taste hundreds of wines, like, you know, get to like know what they're, uh, you know, um, unless they're completely faking it, you know, they, they can detect like these flavors. Um, so blackberry and plum, you know, are kind of classic flavors that people detect in a wine like this. You know, if you really want to be cool and show you your, you really got this extraordinary, you know, sense of taste. People talk about anise, chocolate, thyme, mint tea. You know, in this wine, you taste it, maybe, maybe not. But um, um, and and then then there's also you know wines uh, typically are are you know, are kept in oak barrels. Um, you know, I, I've done that, um, you know, but it doesn't have to be, but red wines generally benefit from oaking. Um, and, and the oak imparts like some flavor to the wine. And especially if it's a, a new oak barrel, like a new French oak barrel, it gives a lot of oak taste. If it's a, an older barrel, like that's been used a couple of times, you know, less of a taste. I mean, generally barrels are only used uh, at the most you know, for whatever, two or three or four vintages. Um, but, but if you're, again, if you really have a great sense of taste, you can detect some oak. And, and like oak flavors are also described as like vanilla. So again, you know, you can, next time you taste a Chardonnay with your friends say, oh, I detect some oak and, you know, some vanilla. And if you really want to be cool, you say you, you taste some nutmeg, which is also kind of like an oaky, you know, flavor. Um, and, and then, um, and there are other, you know, flavors that are detected in wine that are kind of relative to the aging of the wine. So as wine ages, it develops, you know, other flavors too. And, and most of these flavors are, are actually like real chemicals, you know, that have, uh, you know, characteristic, you know, you know, smells and tastes. Um, so if wine is described as like leather or smoke or flint, you know, these are kind of signs of like an aged wine. So, so if you taste this wine in front, you know, in front of your friends, say, I detect like blackberry plum and currants with a hint of vanilla and nutmeg, and uh, you know, you know, you can say anything like sod, dirt, and and there's all these crazy flavors like that people kind of, you know, talk about in wines too. That um, you know, it could be like a, a wet T-shirt or you know, kind of crazy things, um, and people you know, can taste stuff like that, or, and then, or lemongrass, or elderberry, you know, kind of these crazy things. Um, 
but the bottom line is like, if, if you enjoy it and you like it, you know, it's a good wine and it really doesn't matter what you think you're tasting is if you, if you like it, that's good. Um, and, uh, you know, if you want to, you know, kind of hone your senses, you know, drink lots of varieties and, uh, and, and kind of learn. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's what I have to say about wine. You know, I'd be happy to take any questions. So Beautiful. Very nice. Very nice. Very nice. Excellent. 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 Thank you. Okay. Arnie, where, where, Alan here. Where do you actually make your wine? In your house? Yeah, my basement. So what product do you get? Obviously, you, you, what do you buy from a vineyard? Grapes? Oh, no, I, I grow the grapes. <laughs> They're in my yard. Um, but, uh, you know, in, in the past, I've also, you know, when I want to make more wine, I got grapes from, you know, some grape suppliers. Like, you know, I got gotten grapes from California and from Chile and from Argentina. Um, one, la one last question. Could you, in theory, get some grapes from Everfresh? <laughs> no. See, the, the thing that you could, but um, it, it will make a uh, bad wine because the Everfresh grapes are maybe you know, whatever, five or 10%, like, you know, uh, sugar, and it will make, one will make a very, like, low alcohol wine, and two, y you need, uh, in general, like, a stable wine has to have uh, at least a 12 to 14% alcohol content, and, um, and getting back to the Manischewitz wine, um, Manischewitz was started, like, in the 1800s, you know, because, you know, immigrants from Europe, you know, came to the United States, you know, they were used to like making their wine, but they often didn't have access to like to good grapes and even sometimes you had to use raisins. So they're here in America, they, they need to make wine. You know, what are we gonna do? So the Concord grape is like, you know, indigenous to America, you know, especially in New York. And, you know, it's good for Welch's grape juice and good for Welch's grape jelly and a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So let's make a wine out of it. So they start to make wine out of Concord grapes, but, um, as it turns out, Concord grape, grape is not a good wine, grape to make a wine out of. It had what's described as a foxy, you know, taste, which is like a musty, you know, kind of taste to it. So in order to make it palatable, they had to add sugar to it. So thus your sweet Manischewitz wine um, made from Concord grapes. So it's not like the ideal wine for a wine connoisseur, but, um, you can make wine out of any grape, but it may not be a good one. But you, but you need to start with a wine with a, a good sugar content. And and actually, um, if if the wine if you if you're in an area or you had a season where the wines the grapes didn't quite ripen as much as you wanted to, either because it say rained a lot, you know, at the end of the season, uh, you can actually add some sugar to the grapes to you know, build up the sugar content because it all gets convert to alcohol anyway, um, you know, to make a, a wine with a suitable, you know, alcohol level. Thank you, Arnie. Arnie, it's very informative. Can I, a couple questions. One is the planting. So Alan brought up, do you, did you, do you start with a planting from a certain region? Um, or are you starting from seed? No, and no, the second you, you part, start, you start, yeah, okay. And the second part is, what about pests? in the backyard. Yeah, yeah. You lost good questions. Um, so, you know, I, uh, they, they, the vines come as like little kind of saplings. And, um, you know, again, when I started, uh, I really didn't know what I was doing. So I, I kind of, you know, looked at some books and found, uh, you know, a reliable, you know, supplier of, of these saplings. And I, I got a bunch of them. And over the years I've, um, you know, kind of planted more and kind of replanted. Um, uh, so it starts like that. So it starts, you know, kind of about this small. And then, you know, over years, it kind of grows. And then you kind of tie it to the trellis because that's sort of a big part of it. Um, and then there's all kinds of ways to, to prune the vineyard because, you know, every year you kind of have a growth of, you know, lots of yeah. them. They, right. they, they take off and, and you kind of prune them down at the end of the season. And, and there's different ways, you know, which, you know, vines you, you kind of are the great bearing ones and, and which ones, you know, are kind of tied up and tied across. Um, uh, so it, it's sort of, it's farming and, and getting to, back to the pests. Um, in, um, if you've ever been to Napa, you know, I, I was there 
whatever, about, you know, 10 years ago or so, um, you know, I wanted to get some pointers. Um, you know, grapes seem to grow effortlessly there. You know, people are these beautiful vineyards and, and you know, somebody's front, front lawn. You know, Great Neck, uh, not so easy. And, right. and, and in the East in particular, there are like grape funguses, which are, in, in the first few years, they weren't a problem, like in my vineyard. Um, but once they, they eventually get established and then, and, and once like a fungus infects your grapes, you, you, you can't salvage it basically. You, you can't, once it starts, you know, you're, you'll probably lose those grapes. So you have to prophylactically, you know, kind of spray for fungus. And, and there's different kind of ways to do it, um, organically, not organically, you know, I, I sued organically the, around here, you know, the organic stuff doesn't work so well. Um, so I actually kind of consulted with, uh, you know, Cornell has a, a viticulture, you know, kind of program and they have a local, you know, kind of branch of it. And I kind of consulted with them and they gave me some suggestions. So, so, so that's like a, a big thing, you know, at least in the East, like protecting it from, from fungus. And, and the second thing is protecting it from the animal. So, you know, so when, just like, you know, I love the smell of, of sweet, you know, ripe grapes, like the scent of the birds um, and probably the raccoons and the squirrels. Uh, so, um, you know, so you, you kind of, so in the first few years I put like nets, you know, on, and you may have seen nets in vineyards, um, you know, to protect it, but, um, you know, nets are sort of uh, cumbersome, um, you know, so, uh, you know, Vivian had a, a great idea to have, uh, you know, had a, you know, a, a contractor build this big enclosure on our vineyard. So it's sort of basically this big enclosure with, uh, you know, sort of a, a mesh kind of wire, you know, you know, uh, kind of, you know, over within a frame. Um, so that kind of protects it from the, the birds and the animals. And, and I used to have other things like these, you know, blinking lights to scare away the raccoons and stuff like that. But, um, now I, I kind of, uh, you know, I, I kind of sort of have it down as well as I can. But, you know, when, when you see all these beautiful grapes, like in the summer, and, and you have about whatever, four weeks to harvest, you know, you kind of like, you know, sort of, you know, hope, you know, please just last to harvest. Um, you know, because uh, there are some seasons when, you know, we had like bad weather or like kind of, you know, there was a hurricane in um, 2011, which was my, my first harvest. Um, and uh, I kind of harvested early because, uh, um, you know, I didn't want all the grapes to be kind of uh, blown off. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so, uh, and even when, and, and when, when it looks like it's gonna rain a lot um, and you're close to harvest, you should probably harvest before because the rain kind of uh, dilutes the grape, okay. basically. Just so you need to know, I need him just, um, you know, so it's this balance between and, and, and you know, these, you know, um, you know, vintners, you know, go out in the vineyard, they taste the grapes, they sample the grapes, they measure the sugar content, you know, doing it every day. And, and, and sometimes like I make like spot decisions. Okay, today we're going to harvest because you know today the sugar content was right and the pH was right and you know and it's going to rain for the next like you know four or five days. So so it's it's being a it's a farmer you know kind of a, a fancy farmer but still a farmer. I, I remember back in the seventies when they were taking the potato fields out in Long Island and yeah. started to turn them into. They said the soil was was beautiful for it. Yeah. So Great Neck soil is uh, okay. <laughs> It's what I've got. So right. as, as it turns out, you know, I did do a soil analysis. You know, you can take a sample of your soil and I, you know, send it away to these people that do it. And it, it was actually pretty good, like in terms of pH and nutrients. And, um, you know, so I don't have to do much to it, you know, you know, in terms of like fertilizing, you know, maybe just kind of a little bit. Um, but it's, uh, you know, again, I, I kind of just did this, you know, on a, on a whim. Um, and we'll see what happens. And it turns out like I can grow like good grapes and, and, and you know, make what people think is pretty good wine. So that's good enough for me. Thank you very much. <coughs> Arnie, have you ever made honey wine, Ned? No. Uh, okay. No, I can look that up. 
I wanted to make a balsamic vinegar once, but uh, that's a big process. It's a different kind of grape and uh, it's all these uh, moving to barrels and barrels and barrels. But um, for now, like, you know, reds, whites, rosés, like sparkling wine is uh, my repertoire. Mark, this is a great event, but why are we tasting yard? Why, why are we tasting Arnie's wines? <laughs> my wines are like too expensive. They're too expensive. They're too good for our palate. They're, they're so expensive, I have to give them away. But, uh, but I would like to, I am looking forward like once, uh, you know, COVID is kind of behind us to have uh, a big event, you know, in our yard, in the vineyard, and we can, you know, for charity, uh, and, and, and we can taste like, you know, 20 or more of my wines. Uh, so God, God nice. willing, we'll be able to do that uh, soon. And Arnie, how many bottles a year do you produce? Uh, 30 to 50. You know, I, you know, sometimes I make uh, half bottles also so I can uh, stretch it more. Um, but, uh, but basically, uh, you know, people sometimes ask and somebody may be thinking like how many grapes do you need to make a bottle of wine? And, and it's about four, 400 grapes, you know, an average of uh, 10 bunches of 40 grapes in a bunch and about two and a half pounds. Um, you know, to make a bottle of wine. Um, like the, the big barrels that you see, for example, are 60 barrel or 60 gallon barrels, and, and that's about 300 bottles of wine, which is more wine uh, than I make. So I, I have um, I have some small barrels that I've used, but you don't have to use barrels. I mean, you can you know age the wine in glass containers and other things. Um, and there's even ways to get like an oak flavor in the wine without using a barrel that I've used, like putting some oak chips in, you know, during the fermentation. So you can get the benefit of oaking without um, you know, having a barrel. Have you, have you submitted your wine to anybody for uh, any kind of evaluation? I mean, is, it, is it pretty good wine in terms of the industry? Uh, I just know that like some, you know, friends I've given it to said, you know, this is the best wine I've ever tasted, you know, it should win a medal, <laughs> but uh, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I'd like to actually. You know, I, I, I've I've uh, I've tried to give my wine to uh, you know some wine critics, um, um, but uh, um, and I've kind of delivered some to uh, to some of these, um, but you know haven't got you know kind of real formal feedback. Um, Maybe they're not really interested in like amateur winemakers. So send one to Bruce. Send one to Bruce, though. I have. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, like to Bruce, like, kind of interesting. Um, um, you, you can't just like walk on stage and hand them a bottle of wine. You know, it doesn't work that way. Um, but uh, but I have, um, you know, I had a, um, a brother, a brother-in-law's friend of a friend you know, who's like Springsteen's like gardener. Um, I was able to get some wines and apparently they say God to him, but, but even better than that, um, uh, you know, when, when he had his Broadway show, um, you know, again, I'm pretty kind of, I'm a real fanatic. So he, I kind of went like, you know, before the show um, and his wife was walking in, you know, cause you know, people line up, you know, actually not many people were there at that time but I handed her some bottles of wine and, and she's a musician too, has made some albums and I made one of her album too. So I handed her a bottle of like, you know, his wine, her wine, she, she took it, she was great, this is great. And, um, and, uh, and then, you know, when she, and then I kind of stuck around when she was kind of walking out, I said, I hope you like the wine. She says, yeah, I'm taking it home. So I think it got to his house. Now, if I was Bruce Springsteen and some like stranger, like makes a bottle of wine for you, uh, you know, I, I'm an honest guy and a nice guy, and, and I'm, I don't make poison wine, but, you know, he may not, like, know that, so. You could have included your business it. card, you know. I, I have given some to his, like, assistant manager, too. I got some there, but but just uh, when, I, when I gave his wife wine, I'll kind of just show you one other thing. Um, She, like, during the show, she actually posted it on her Instagram page. 
Wow. Like the wines that, that she staged like in the theater, like in the dressing room. So, uh, so that's, that's, as, uh, that's as good as I could do. Uh, wow. So, uh, cool. so uh, and uh, whatever. So, uh, um, did she remember that you did? It's, it's all like I got a thank you note or like, you know, come in, like drink it with me, but. Or, or, or I'll, uh, I'll endorse it. <laughs> that's that's as good as it. I think that's as good as it. I can expect. Uh, yeah, Arnie, are there, are there amateur winemaking competitions? Yeah, yeah, there are. Um, I uh, yeah, I could try that. Um, Sounds like I'm, you need uh, an agent. If I feel, if I feel competitive, <laughs> right. Arnie, you, you you made some French term for the terrain that you grow the wines in, and you didn't say what the characteristics of your backyard was. I mean, what, what wines do you think it can do really well? If, if someone was gonna characterize Arnie's wines, what would they say about them? I have no idea. I just see like, you know, dirt and, uh, you know, poor drainage sometimes and, uh, you know, so-so sun. Um, but again, it's the only like spot that I have. So, uh, you know, again, people, when they, you know, plant a vineyard, they, we need this much sun and, and you know this elevation and and you have to plant the vine the vines in this direction north south or or east west um, um, but uh, I, I I this is like the only spot I had I'm gonna do it and we'll see what happens and uh, turned out good enough. Arnie, you did good. Thank you. It's good it's to have like, family it's, support. It's from, from the Thank you for family, family and friends. No, yeah. No, Thank you. We're filling up the, uh, the, the Zoom uh, you know, screen. That was a great okay. job. Absolutely excellent. Thank you. We'll just show Thank you. We have wanna... a special bottle. Oh, there you go. See, I made a wedding wine so, for you know Marcel and Ben. This is so a I made one, one for, one. for Mars and Ruby. I made one for my niece, El Yan. Um, so, uh, yeah, I have kind of fun with the labels and uh, putting all those, like, you know, pompous things on, on the label. Um, and I mean, don't forget that, that Charles saved the vineyard one. Exactly. Yeah, so <laughs> that, that year that we were in Napa, you know, there was like... A, for our anniversary. <laughs> right, for our 25th anniversary, like 10 years ago. Um, you know, Charles uh, was home. And, and he calls and says, like, you know, the, the trellis, like, collapsed, you know, so, uh, so he, like, you know, kind of resuspended the trellis and, and saved the vineyard. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> for that, I'm always in debt to Charles for, like, you know, saving our vineyard. And, and like, I've, I've since, like, um, fortified the trellis, uh, you know, to make it sturdier. Um, but uh, that's one of the challenges of growing grapes. Well, great, great, Mark. Thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us. This is, for me, absolutely one of the best seminars, lectures. That it, was, it was terrific. Yep. Arnie, I, uh, uh, no, no pun intended. It's definitely homegrown. It's, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> um, I'm but sure like, we all like learned I said, a like lot. God willing, when uh, code is behind us, we'll have a big event and uh, we'll stroll the vineyard and uh, right. And you can even. Uh, you know, I've had Charles's friends, you know, come over for vineyard events and they stomped on the grapes and we don't do that so much anymore, but it, it's still fun to do. And the some Chateau of them Lef wanted to move in with us after they saw right. the wine. <laughs> right. You can call it Chateau Lafitte. Yeah, yeah actually our, our vi you know, vineyard is Chateau Marcel, by the way. This, this is Chateau Marcel after <laughs> my daughter Marcel because uh, it sounds nice, right? It yeah. sounds great. <laughs> That was French. So, yeah, so welcome to Chateau Marcel. Okay. Okay. Thank okay. you. Everybody have a have a Zeus and Pesach. Well, everyone. And and you know, and, and, uh, and we did this like on a Thursday night. So if you didn't finish your bottle of wine tonight, you can have it for Shabbat. Right. Um, and that's why okay. we well, taste, uh, what? that's that's why I didn't tell you to buy like you know ten different bottles of wine. So uh, you have to waste them <laughs> <laughs> or have a mini bottle like that. And, <laughs> and, and we can uh, come. It, it's such a small bottle. We can come to your house for a refill. <laughs> but uh, again, like, you know, for the seder, if you want to have fun, like try different, you know, a few different wines. And again, you know, there are wines in all like price points, and you can get you know very nice you know kosher wines in the you know in the twenty dollar range. Uh, 
you know, you can also get them in the, you know, 40, 60, 80, you know, 100 and more range. But, uh, you know, it's it's hard to go wrong, really. Um, Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Mark. Thank Thank you. I'm finishing. Andy, good okay. to see you. Andy. Good to see everybody. Yeah, see, I, I right. didn't Be well. I, I, I love <laughs> Zoom. Now we can see Andy. He's back in Great Neck. <laughs> <laughs> like he never left. Never yeah. left. Actually, That's you know, right. you know they, the wine is grown in every state, you know, in the country. Um, you know, maybe not so well, but well, we uh, have figs. They're, they're, we have but, figs. But, but there are vineyards yeah. in every in every uh -huh. in, Ala in Alaska. You know, from Alaska, you know, to Hawaii, to Florida, to Maine, and everywhere in between. Um, uh, so, uh, in, in kosher, but I would have to say that you're probably the only kosher wine being grown in Great Neck. Would that be fair to say? I think I'm, I'm the I think I'm the only kosher vineyard in Long Island. <laughs> Um, but, um, if you accept my Hefsher, uh, but, uh, you know, yes, I do. You probably, just, it's probably just, me making, it's just me, me making the wine, but, but now, you know, there's, um, you know, many regions of the world like that have the best wines, you know, Bordeaux, you know, um, you know, kind of everywhere, you know, Italy, you know, pretty much every great wine growing region, you know, has, you know, kosher wineries. So if, if not like, like a, a purely kosher vineyard or winery, a lot of these wineries um, kind of, um, you know, make a kosher, make a kosher brand. So they, I guess they bring in some mashkiach and, and do some supervision and kind of make a, you know, a batch of, of kosher wines. So. Uh, okay, so, how, how did, what makes a wine kosher? I'm sorry, but I don't even know. Yeah, I kind of, you know, started with this, you know, basically two things, you know, all the ingredients have to be kosher. So, you know, there are no additives to add to the wine that aren't kosher. And, and, and most fine wine is basically just grapes and whatever indigenous yeast, you know, is, is kind of in the area. And um, so if you have well-established like, you know, vineyard and winery, there are kind of established yeasts. So, but if you're going to add things to the wine, like they're fining agents and you know, different ways to manipulate the wine, which, which is done, um, you know, they kind of need to be kosher, you know, kosher certified. Um, and the second Shabbos thing, Shabbos. yeah, the second thing is like, it has Shabbos to be Shabbos, yes, from, from the time the grape is crushed to the time it's bottled, it has to be only handled by someone who's, who's Shomer Shabbos. And like I was saying in the beginning, that was like to prevent us from mingling with the pagans because the, the pagans use wine in their ceremonies and, um, you know, so that way uh, we wouldn't go to their ceremonies and, and have their wine because, you know, you know, we don't consider it kosher. Great. So nothing is done on Shabbat. None Thank you. Um, yeah. Well, good well uh, you know, um, I mean, it could be, you could, I think if the grapes are harvested on Shabbat, you know, that's not, because, you know, a lot of these vineyards are run by non-Jews even, uh, or, you know, non-religious people, but it, it's, it's more like, that the handling of the of the of the wine from the crush, you know, to the uh, to the bottling has to be, you know, done by someone who's Shomer Shabbat. So so they'll have a guy in there who's Shomer Shabbat that does all the hands-on stuff, and then he'll, you know, he'll pour out the wine for the winemaker to kind of taste, and he'll decide he needs to age more. We need to blend it with this and that and that, and uh, uh, but the actual kind of, you know hands-on stuff, you know, is done by the Shomer Shabbat, uh, you know, Mashkiach. Awesome. Thanks. Okay. All right. Good night. All right. Thanks Good for joining. Night. Everybody have a Zizu. Thank minute. you. Um, be Mark, behind me. Those are like some of my lines. <laughs> Mark, another great men's club event. Thank you very much. Thank you. Fantastic. You're the best. Arnie did, Arnie did a great Thanks job. Thanks for joining. <laughs> Work very all. hard. <laughs> Thank you all. Did you do this for my men's club? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's recorded. <laughs> recorded. We have the recording. <laughs> but I'll do it special for your men's club too. Yeah.